sitting down here with Orioles GM Mike Elias here from Sarasota, Florida, spring training. Mike, thanks so much for joining us. You bet, Paul. Great to be here, as always, kick off the year. I wanted to ask you a little bit more about scouting because you started as a scout. How did you get into scouting? I was playing baseball. I was a starting pitcher, so when you're not pitching, you watch a lot of baseball, and I always enjoyed watching the other players, sizing them up, getting an eye on who was going to be drafted and where they'd go in the draft. So I was always interested in the draft and scouting. I realized I wasn't going to be able to play professionally. I wasn't good enough. And um, you know, my college coach at the time, a guy named John Stuper, was a former major league pitcher and he had some connections and um, ultimately got me in touch with uh, Dan Kantrovitz, who at the time was with the St. Louis Cardinals, and they hired me to be a young scout at the age of 23. So. Um, cut my teeth, uh, kind of learning on the job. A lot of talk in scouting is about the five tools that a player can have. The common baseball idea, however, over the past couple years is it's less important to have all five tools and more important maybe to have one or two great tools. Is that kind of your thinking as well? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think you start getting into what we call uh, player profiles. And a guy can just have one or two tools, and if they're strong enough, they can carry him to being a great major league player, like for instance somebody with no defensive value uh, but who hits 320 with 30 home runs like Edgar Martinez. Um, you know, it's a, it's a Hall of Fame caliber career, but you talk about that profile now, he's, he's going to be a DH or a, a first baseman. So uh, the tools really work into what and where you're going to be able to play on the baseball diamond, not that it's necessary to have all five of them. How hard is it to determine the difference between a guy who has a great tool and somebody who is just capable in a certain area? It's tough, and that's what the scouting business is. There are some tools where we are aided by technology, uh, even very simple technology like a stopwatch or a radar gun. We can know specifically if somebody is what we would call an 80 runner, an 80 being the top grade you can get on the, on the scouting scale. Um, same with the fastball. When it comes to a hit tool or a glove tool, that requires the, the, the scout's impressions and opinions to get it right, and, and it's, it's no science, so that's where the fun comes in. Moving from the young players to some of the older players, a lot of times when a team is looking to make trades at the deadline, they'll send scouts to see a veteran player in a major league ballpark, even though you might have plenty of tape on that guy that is available to everybody. Is there something to sending a scout to see somebody in person, even though you might have seen him on videotape? Yeah, sure. I mean, we have every bit of video imaginable, that, that um, especially at the major league level. Um, we also have uh, tech um, that, that fans can get on the internet now with, with StatCast data. So we've got all that, but there is still value to be added uh, by sending a, an experienced evaluator to the park to watch the player. A lot of that is because uh, the, the television broadcasts don't catch everything, especially on defense. Um, there's quite a bit happening pre-pitch, between pitches, and even after the ball is struck, that's not caught on the, uh, the broadcast camera. Uh, but also a scout in a ballpark tends to get a lot of information, I and mean, he talks to people around the team um, and gets a sense of what's going on with the player. So uh, there's certainly value to be added there, even in today's game. How does one scout hire another scout. Do you look for people who have the same evaluation tools? You look for different perspectives? What do you look for when hiring another scout under you? Sure, well, the, the first thing is the scout typically has had to have gotten um, his foot in the door in the baseball world, whether that is, you know, maybe he's just coming off the field having played a few years of minor league ball, or he's worked for a perfect game or a private scouting service or he's had an internship or two with another major league team, all that helps because you got to be around the amateur player market. You've got to kind of learn the language that scouts speak a little bit. Otherwise, the learning curve is going to be a little too steep for that first full-time job. So once we see somebody who's got the resume, we then want to make sure that they've got the mindset we're looking for and that's um, wanting to learn, you know, having a good baseball eye, but being humble, being curious all of those things, it's, it's uh, much like you would uh, interview for any job. When you have a player that you personally scout or that you have seen in person, you go to bat for that player, you say this player is the guy we want to draft, we want to evaluate, and then he goes on to have success. How much pride do you take personally in seeing success stories come from guys that you scouted? It's extraordinarily rewarding because it's so hard. Um, you know, you look at the draft and it's, it's filled with failure. Um, so when we do get a guy right, or even halfway right, it, it, it feels really good and it's, um, 
you know, rewarding for all the work that you put in and a reminder that, you know, you know what you're doing. Um, and over time, you're, um, you just hope that your body of work is a little bit better than, than average or better than the next guys, uh, even though this is a tough business. And because that batting average sometimes is below 500 just because of the difficulty of the business, do you ever look back on the misses, try to evaluate the things you might have missed or the things that you might have evaluate differently if you were to do it again? Oh yeah, they absolutely haunt you. Um, I mean, you, you think of uh, bad first round picks that you were part of, you think of bad second round picks, bad seventh round picks, and you never stop thinking about it. Um, at least I think the good scouts are that way because it helps them make them a little bit better process-wise the next time when they think about what they, what they could have done differently. Uh, but yeah, it is, it is not fun and it never leaves you. The role of a GM is of a much bigger scope, obviously, than a particular scout. How much scouting do you still get to do? How much tape do you still get to watch, particularly of young guys who are about to be drafted? Well, uh, when we're preparing for the draft, we watch video and review reports and read statistics on all of the players um, prior to the draft. So I, I, I'm intimately involved in that process. Um, in terms of in-person scouting, I still do a, a good bit of it. Um, I, part of that is because we train here in Florida and Florida is like the best hotbed. In February and March, I'm able to get out and see some games that I might not otherwise get to. But right now, uh, with where we're at as an organization, we're picking high in the draft. And certainly for those picks, um, for the number two overall pick in 2020, I'm gonna personally scout every one of them. The life of a scout can obviously be very difficult as well. You spend a lot of time away from your family on the road. Do you miss certain aspects of in-person scouting or are you okay with not getting to do that kind of stuff? Yeah, the, uh, the, the chase of it and the, the sprint uh, that takes place from about February 1st to, to the draft in June is something that, that I miss being a part of every single day. Um, it's rough uh, on your, your sleep and your uh, family time um, for sure, uh, but uh, it, it is a lot of fun. Uh, you, you, you make a lot of friends and meet a lot of good people out on the road, but it, it's, uh, it's difficult. You're having to not only evaluate the players, but check the weather, uh, check flights and hotel rates constantly, um, and it's, there's nothing like it. What's the biggest misconception you think that the general public and baseball fans have about the business of scouting? Well, I think it's that. Um, you know, I think some fans, they, when they see a scout at the games, they think, oh, this guy just watches baseball games for a living. Um, but that is, the, the, the part where you're sitting in the park watching the game or standing in the park watching the game is about 10% of your real work. and, and uh, 40 to 50 percent of it is just travel or working on travel or getting from point A to point B. It's a lot of driving, um, a lot of really difficult uh, types of travel. You're getting to really obscure parts of the United States where they don't have nice hotels and they don't have airports nearby and um, there's so much that goes into that and then you have to write reports and then you have to get on the phone with agents and then you have to talk to your connections. So there's so much that goes into it. There's really not enough hours in the day when we're talking about the baseball season. And of course, you probably don't have many hours in your day here in Sarasota being the GM of 67 players in that clubhouse as well. So thanks for taking the time to sit down here on Mass and All Access. You bet, Paul, thanks. Michael Elias, GM of the Baltimore Orioles.